I've been with enough powerful people to know they know stuff. They know stuff. There's an agenda somewhere. And so what it says to me is, to the average person, man, uh, we don't know what's coming down the pike. You better get your food security lined up, whether it's a direct line to a farmer that you know or some backyard raised beds and some chickens, a little bit of skill, a little bit of experience, hook up with some homesteaders and some neighbors and some friends and and get a loose-knit group of, of, of collaborating folks who know how to grow stuff, build stuff, and fix stuff so that I mean, I think I think that th- thinking people right now, a lot of us are trying to minimize our dependency and engagement with things that that can hurt us. This is Donegan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver dealer with Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized, private service from one of the oldest and best respected companies in the business. 30 years strong, A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau, zero complaints, licensed and bonded, insured delivery or vault storage or IRAs, excellent prices, privacy and confidentiality, pay by check, money order, ACH or wire, satisfaction guaranteed. Call me directly at 419-819-9209 or my associate at 310-562-6400 or email us at kaiser at milesfranklin.com. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. We have a returning guest who hasn't been on for quite a while. We're speaking with Joel Salatin. He's a co-founder of Polyface Farms in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. He's a well-known author, speaker, lecturer, teacher, an advocate for self-sufficiency and food integrity. He trains hundreds of college interns uh, every year and learn, so that they learn how to do what our grandparents knew how to do, and that is to be more self-reliant and so that we can all learn how to be more self-sufficient and find out where our food is coming from and uh, face the uncertain times ahead with a joyous heart. Joel, thanks for coming back on the show. Thank you, Dunnigan. It's always a treat to be with you. We were just talking before we got started here about some new programs that you're helping people to uh, find out about and that you're finding out and uh, connecting people with. It's remarkable what we've gone through in the last year. So many constraints and uh, lockdowns and concerns on various people's parts, civil unrest and financial strains and all kinds of things, employment and relocation and urban flight we talked about the last time we had you on. But you and you were just educating me about some innovative and uh, novel ways that people are responding with a great positive and constructive and collaborative uh, ideas to make new things possible in this time of change. If you could first maybe kick us off with some of those, I think people will be very excited to hear about those, and we'll get to some specific viewers' questions after that. Sure, sure. So, uh, so the the big picture is that um, that there is a a huge demand right now for people who want they they want to get a look. People want to get away. They want recreation, entertainment opportunities. They want to do something with their family. They want to do. Uh, something to to you know in- infotainment to, and um, and the problem is that conference centers, trade shows, uh, uh, resorts are now kind of a taboo thing. Uh, people are they, they don't want to go there. The hosts don't want to host them uh, anymore. We're doing all virtual, but we you know we are social beings, and we love to we love to go places, see things, do things, and. And commiserate. So, there are some uh, real platforms trying to chase these literally billions, billions of dollars that are out here unclaimed in this whole kind of uh, recreational get together uh, inter- uh, space. That there are some really clever groups trying to capture those for for farms. Uh, you know, farms have have certainly um, um, historically. I mean, certainly in our lifetime, uh, have not been places of wealth. 
uh, they've been playing. You know, if you if you stay in business another year, you know you've been successful. <laughs> and and so uh, the idea of of rural agrarian recreational entertainment and event opportunities uh, is a is a welcome influx of dollars, a new potential influx of dollars with this kind of new. Um, new dynamic we have in that in that movement market uh, uh, marketplace. So uh, there's a, there's an outfit called Yonder that's trying to be a global platform for creating rural rural experience packages. Yeah, Yonder firms. And, yeah, yeah, and uh, and they're they're very sharp um, in getting some traction. Uh, there's another outfit called um, Harvest. Uh, that, harvest hosts, that, yeah. Yes, harvest hosts that that uh, offers camping. I don't know if you're fam- you're aware, but right now the um, the the rental for RVs for campers and RVs. I mean, you can't find one. They they, they are co- why? Because nobody wants to stay in a hotel. And so here we've got you know thousands of people who would normally go on some. You know, trip a destiny that ends up in a resort, a hotel, or something like that, and and instead they're jumping in an RV or a camper and heading out, and they need places to park, and so now there's this whole uh, um, you know electronic platform to hook up people to farm camping. It's cheap; they get to stay on a farm. Um, and obviously, farmers that are opening up for this tend to be farmers that have interesting farms. You know, they, they mm. tend to not be Cargill and, and uh, <laughs> you know, Purdue chicken farms. Uh, not very many feedlots, but you know, they're, they're interesting farms. They might have some animals. They might have some things going on. And so, this is this is a really uh, amazing and cool uh, opportunity, I think, for farmers to be able to to tap into a new income stream maybe that they've been reluctant to do. And these outfits, of course, offer experience and expertise in this space that farmers tend to, tend to lack because, you know, we farmers, you know, we, we, we generally were farmers because we don't like people. <laughs> Focus, focusing, focusing on farming itself. Yeah, we've certainly been close to some of those major commercial uh, factory feedlots. You wouldn't want to be anywhere near. Whew. Uh, no. No, but uh, there, there is there is a lot of open space and opportunity here uh, off the beaten path, and um, I'm I'm real excited about. So, so one of the things that we've done here, we um, we're we're absolutely we're actually looking at, at joining uh, as a steward the Yonder Farms um, uh, collaborative uh, outfit. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, here at at, at our farm. We've already um, we've looked at all this and said, hey, let's let's just create a um, a gathering venue for 2021. And so we've got, I think, six uh, gatherings already uh, scheduled for the basically once a month, one a month during the season. We have a very large uh, hoop house that right now has chickens in it, but uh, we'll clean that out in the spring, and and uh, and it'll be just delightful for we've already done about four of these in the last year and a half and just love them we can have we can host 300 people and that's not a big crowd it's primarily outside out in the country and uh we've got a couple of these scheduled there'll be kind of wellness wellness summits we've got a a rogue food uh, gathering to to um feature people who have done value adding food without inspection uh, whether it's a marketing gimmick or a constitutional mm-hmm. gimmick or whatever, but mm-hmm. uh, sometimes cir- circumvention becomes uh, more efficient than compliance, and we're, we're kind of getting that way in our socialistic system. Uh, we'll do a uh, we'll do a pastured livestock uh, national gathering, and we'll conclude the season with a entertainment, a historical reenactor, and and some great. Um, Original music by uh, Nashville legend uh, Rory Feek. So, uh, it, you know, it's it's a wide variety, but the the basic idea is to just provide a um, a, a safe rural venue that people feel comfortable with 
to come and, and gather at least, you know, partially. Not It won't be 1,000, it won't be 2,000, but it'll be, you know, enough that you can actually um, feel like you have a social structure and economically we can, you know, pay somebody to come and, and uh, mm-hmm. share their, their wisdom or their talent or whatever it is. When you have these, um, like, replacing conferences, basically, with outdoor learning events, things like that, where there's there's more enrichment because you're actually in a setting that's that's more hands-on or more direct observation. When it comes to like how speakers, uh, people listening to and, and absorbing the, the uh, presentations from speakers, how do you set that up to keep it so that people feel like it's, it's uh, whatever, safer than a current conference center would be? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, we are out here in the country. You're not, mm-hmm. you're not mm-hmm. in the city. That in itself you know, creates a bit of a, you know, a wide open space field, uh, a feel. And uh, in the hoop house, we have, uh, uh, you know, wonderful circulation. We can open the ends, uh, and there's, there's tremendous circulation through its natural circulation. There's no, there's no duct work. There's no HVAC systems. I mean, as we start, you know, looking at all the different elements of this whole, uh, you know, COVID thing, as you know, uh, there's more and more evidence showing that air change, um, uh, air filters, all this stuff. Well, we don't need any. We're, you know, it's it's not a great big hotel structure. It's mm-hmm. not a great big thing. So we're just out here in this in this uh, tunnel tube with mm-hmm. westerly breezes running through it that we can control as big or little as we want. And um, and so there's no duct work. There's there's nothing. You know, there's nothing there. It, it, in fact. In fact, it normally doesn't even have people in it. It has chickens or pigs or rabbits, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or or tomato plants or whatever, right? So, so uh, yeah, there's there's that, and um, and you know the, the the downside is obviously people can't we can't accommodate people here to, to stay here overnight. Mm. So you got to stay in town, you know, at a hotel and come out. But um, but at least for the you know for the days goings on and we and we can feed everybody we've got you know we've got uh, big barbecue grills we've got you know a commercial kitchen pavilion you know these are all these are things these are things that that you can do but listen really successful farms today i'm I'm not talking about industrial farms but but in the in the kind of medium medium farm space the ones that are really successful tend to have some sort of of aggressive public interface, um, you know, you're not big enough to just make it on on commodity prices, mm. and you're not small enough to to um, work in town and run your farm too. So you got this this interesting little middle space, and and most most of these kind of middle farms that are that are doing well uh, have some sort of a public interface. Whether it's you know it includes direct marketing, it includes a branded product, it might include a value adding, it might include a, you know marriages, event spaces, whatever. But there's a, there's some sort of a of of a um, a positive positioning to attract people out. So you so you you're more than just a a production facility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm getting what I'm getting from you. I would call a multi-dimensional engagement with the community, basically, or with. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And, and and when these people come, of course, they buy things, but they 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 um, you know. So we have we have picnic tables. We have uh, a big corn box for kids to play, and that's been a huge hit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, any, anybody can have a sandbox, but we have a corn box. <laughs> Of course, it's you know, with all the dried, with all dried the, uh, kernel shelled corn in there. Yeah, yeah, just whole shelled corn. Yeah, but you know, it's uh, it's got you know Tonka toys and dump trucks, oh, you know, nice. all the kids' toys like you can see in a sandbox, except it's a corn box. Well, kids love it. I mean, they go in there, they spend they spend an hour, mm-hmm. you know, and guess what? Next month they say, "Mommy, can we go back to that farm with the corn box?" Mommy says yes, and so she comes back and she buys, uh, you know, a couple a couple big glasses of kombucha on tap that we have. And she gets, you know, some food and gets some uh, some uh, uh, snack sticks, and and you know, and they and they they spend their their mm-hmm. morning here, and they're not fighting kids at the park. You know, they're not they're not, you know, dealing with 
a bunch of snitches that are telling them they got to put their mask on or off mm-hmm. or whatever. Uh, I mean, there's there's a there's a very there's an openness that's and if they want, they can walk around the corner and pick up a chick or or you know look mm. at the pigs or mm. you know any, any other number of of things that create that create memories. There's a book selling the invisible, and it and the whole thing is that people don't actually buy stuff; they buy they buy memories, and, and, and they buy emotion. Mm-hmm. And so you know we we understand that while we sell you know, beef and pork and chicken and all this stuff. Um, we're also selling the the fantasy or the, the, the dream of a of a regenerative healthy world, of, of clean water. We're selling that dream to people. Hmm. Now it's interesting because I just noticed just in the past two weeks and probably because I'm not on television much, but I just noticed Verbo, who I believe has been hit pretty hard through this as any other part of the hospitality industry has been, uh, there, there are advertisements that I've seen a couple different ones of in the past week uh, do exactly what you say. You know, this is the checkerboard where Grandpa will learn how to well, be bonding with his grandson. And this is the, and it's about it's about rediscovering family, rediscovering relationships, rediscovering that unplugged time together. So they're selling uh, not just, hey, we give you the best rate if you get away on a vacation with us, but it's it's about what it really means to people, the meaning behind it. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. People, people don't go on vacation to, uh, or, or I mean, people, people don't go on a trip to um, whatever. See a to, to be in a different city or ride in a different car, <laughs> you know, or sleep in a different bed. They go there for all of the all of the, the tangential things that happen. Uh, when you when you unplug from your, when you unplug from mm-hmm. your routine, yeah, that mountaintop experience, so to speak, that really gets you reconnected back to what it what it what it really all means. Um, yeah, my wife and I just had the opposite experience on a recent so called vacation that fell apart because it all it got consumed with business, and we we, we just keep um, <laughs> we're still licking our wounds from that one because we realize what a what a loss you never get that week back that and that's true about for any of us in our lives. You never get yeah. that day back. You never get that moment back. You never get that opportunity back. You can still, right. tomorrow is a new day, God willing. You get a new, new yeah. chance to make new choices. But just to be mindful about the precious times that we have and to really take the opportunities to make the most of them in a very meaningful and deep way and not just frantic activity and distraction. Very interesting. Uh, so we've got some questions for you. And I'll put the links, by the way, I'll put the links to Yonder Farms, Harvest Hosts, uh, the Selling the Invisible book. And then also, if you've got any uh, links, I'll put Polyface Farms in there so people can check out your event calendar and stay plugged in on that kind of stuff. Sure, that's great. Okay. Um, We have a number of questions, uh, one of which is about the announcement that came out in the last month that Bill Gates is now the largest owner of farmland in the United States. And thought, I remember we spoke with you a couple of years ago when Amazon bought Whole Foods and we were kind of scratching our head and going, hmm, is this a good thing or a bad thing? You know, is this, oh, great, new, um, a bigger platform for in- food integrity to get reached to a broader audience? Or is, hmm, is this the evil envir- empire doing an engulf and devour thing? So do you have any personal um, perspectives on the very wealthy buying up land? What does that mean to the ordinary person? Uh, is it a good example we should follow? Is it something that we should have any concern about? What's your take on that? Yeah, well, um, in conjunction with that, um, you may be aware that, um, oh, if I can find it here on the desk here very quickly, Klaus, um, Klaus Schwab, he is the, he is the, here it is, um, he is the head of the World Economic Forum. Um, I saw a, a an interview with him uh, just a couple of days ago, and took some notes down, and it was really interesting. He was talking about the he's kind of the the head guru of this global. You probably heard the phrase the Great Reset, mm-hmm. the Great Reset, and um, and so he was describing some of that, and he talked about coming food shortages. Mm-hmm. And he said that we will just make sure that all the vaccinated will get plant-based food. In other words, unvaccinated won't. And, of course, it's going to be plant-based, not animal-based. 
so you, you, you combine this, you, you, and, and you see Bill Gates buying up, he's bought up uh, farmland. Yes, he now owns 242,000 acres in, I think it's 18 states. And, um, and you, know, you scratch your head and you say, hmm, you know, what, what are they seeing that I'm not seeing? Because people like that are, they know things way before you and I know them. And, um, or at least that's the way to bet. And so why would this um, Microsoft geek suddenly start buying up all this farmland? You combine that with what the World Economic Forum, Klaus, said. And remember, the World Economic Forum, these folks were the, were the ones who simulated a pandemic outbreak two years ago before it ever happened. They, they convened in, I don't know where it was, some European city, and did a week, uh, a, a multi-day simulation and different groups, you, know, you be you be the media, you be the medical community, you be the you know the the, the conservative uh, peasant, and you be the you know the liberal uh, peasant, and 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 let's message this and see what it looks like. Well, if you've seen the uh, documentary Plandemic, um, uh, one of the things that they did was split screen, and they they showed the two year ago simulated discussions. And the today, the actual news news media, the actual real time uh, uh, anchor message, news anchor messaging, and it was identical. I mean, it, it, it was it was it was so profoundly identical that you realize, goodness, um, this didn't just come from fairy dust out of the blue. And I'm I'm not a big conspiratist. I'm, I'm not I'm not moving that. But I, I am I am suggesting that. I've been with enough powerful people to know they know stuff. They know stuff. They they get in their huddles. They get in their rooms. They get in their conferences. Uh, I mean, my, the most profound one for me was um, several years ago. I was to do a, a farm workshop in uh, Sweden, and the Royal College of Agriculture there at Sweden, like three weeks before three weeks before I was supposed to come, contacted the host. It was, it was a it was a shared thing between an NGO and uh, an NGO and this and the Rural Agriculture College. And about three weeks before I was to come, the Agriculture College called the NGO and said, "We're pulling out of the sponsorship. We're, we're not going to sponsor." And the NGO said, "Well, why?" And they said, "Well, because um, because Monsanto offered us uh, that they would they would fund the entire ag school if we got rid of our nine environmental sciences professors, shut down that department, and." Uh, so there was some scrambling, and, and the NGO came up with some other sponsors, and they were able to have me anyway. So when I was there, of course, curiosity killed the cat. I said, what in the world is Monsanto? That's a grain company. What do they have to do with Sweden? Sweden doesn't grow any grain, you know. And my host said, oh, well, it's because with global warming, they think that all of the north of the Scandinavian countries, Finland, Sweden, and Norway, all of that that cold uh, north of the Scandinavian countries is going to open up and become the breadbasket of the world, and so you know they want to get their foot in the door and be here when all that happens. And it just struck me, you and I, we look at we, we you know we look at we look at you know a, a two minute news report about a meeting that happened in you know Copenhagen or in you know uh, Davos, Switzerland or whatever. You know we, we see these little bites and 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 you see these people you know and of course the camera. Uh, clips to a uh, you know to this big mahogany table with you know twenty people sitting around and what are they really talking about? And it struck me when he told me about this thing that that's what they're really talking about. And so to answer the question, what does this mean? What it means is there must be something going on about about production agriculture about food production about something that is that is making the most powerful mover and shakers in the world want to position themselves to i mean that's what they always do right they position themselves so they can take advantage of crises catastrophes movements in the marketplace whatever it may be and so when i see this happening I'm thinking, what does he know that I don't know? 
And the chances are that there's something coming along that we're not aware of. Again, I'm not I'm not a huge, you know, conspiratist, but I but I don't think that very many things happen out of the blue. I, I, I think that I think that most things happen because there's 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 an agenda somewhere. And so what it says to me is to the average person, man, uh we don't know what's coming down the pike. You better get your food security lined up, whether it's a direct line to a farmer that you know or some backyard raised beds and some chickens, a little bit of skill, a little bit of experience, hook up with some homesteaders and some neighbors and some friends and, and get a loose-knit group of, of, of collaborating folks who know how to grow stuff, build stuff, and fix stuff so that I mean, I think I think that thinking people right now, a lot of us are trying to minimize our dependency and engagement with things that that can hurt us spiritually, physically, or or emotionally. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I, I in the last two weeks, I've run into half a dozen people. I've I've canceled my Facebook account. I'm off. I'm, I'm not doing it anymore. Mm-hmm. And and so the, I think that there is in the land there is this kind of kind of uh, uh, undercurrent this this undercurrent of of disengagement from what we see going on in in D.C. and part of that is self reliance self sufficiency get your act together um, uh, I mean I've even heard some. Some financial gurus say, cash in your 401k mm-hmm. and invest it in classes to learn how to fix engines and and do your own plumbing. Uh, you know, these are all, you know, uh, in, in, in when things become unsettled, these are skills and needs that that people have when uh, when things start to get unsettled. Yeah, we just uh, had an interview with James Rawls from survivalblog.com, and his title for our talk was, We are living in the age of deception and betrayal. Prepare accordingly, invest accordingly, relocate accordingly. And part of that, as you're saying, is you better secure your source of healthy food and where your, where your food's going to come from as part of that in the community you're going to be living in. Yes, yes. Um, you know that's that's all a part. Goodness, in the last oh, in the last uh, year and a half, um, I've shepherded uh, three or four um, urban refugees to find property actually near near mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. That's where they wanted to be. They said, "We think you'll be the last guy standing," and that you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that that gives us a little bit of uh, you know a little bit you know you, you if things are going down you hope that if when you're the last man standing you know there will be some cleverness to you know create some solutions before you're the only guy standing um, anyway I mean we we see it we feel it I mean we we get contacted out of the blue you know by people hey i'm i'm concerned uh, i need to i need to get to a i need to get to a dock i need to get to a safe haven mm-hmm. and uh and yeah that's that's really happening and i can tell you around here and i think this is pretty much all over the country um because you know we have helped several of these people you know get places the the market for what I call, you know, small, small scale, uh, rural property, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, anything under, say, anything under twenty five acres, um, and a lot of them are, you know, three. Boy, if you if you've got a house on three or four acres, those things are selling. Literally, they go on the market, and they're they're gone in less than twenty four hours. Often. Ten percent higher than asking price. Mm-hmm. It, it's just unbelievable. Now, it doesn't seem to be affecting commercial farmland, like you know something over fifty acres, where you start getting into to bigger money. That price isn't moving. At least I don't see it. 
my realtor buddies don't see it. We don't see land like that moving in price yet. Uh, I think prob- partly because COVID is making people not want to make great, great big decisions. But there's a big difference between a house of two or three acres versus, you know, 100 acres. Uh, that's, a, that's a much bigger, it's mm-hmm. a bigger decision. It's a bigger, it's a bigger jump off the cliff, that sort of thing. And so, so what these folks are doing, they're buying, they're buying a property here, and then and then we're managing it, you know. So they because they don't know how to farm, they don't know what to do it. And so we we can you know we can keep it in land use taxation, we can you know improve it and and, and manage it. But they know that if they can get out of the city, they'll have food, shelter, and clothing, and um, and so it's a you know it's it's a it's an interesting time. We've got some viewers' questions we'd like to turn our attention to if we could. One of them plays right into what you're describing, and that is a question asking, if someone is just starting out on either just a, a very small piece of land, you've talked to us about this. In fact, we have a, an interview from, with you in the past we'll put a link to in the description of this called Feed Your Family on Zero Acres. But uh, the question is, what are your favorite one, two, and three? What are your top three crops, whether it be animal or vegetable, that people should consider being suc- most likely to be successful with on when just starting out, and maybe it depends on the climate, but in the, in the U.S. in general, uh, what do you consider to be uh, good winning bets for a, for a newbie to get started with? What are your favorite three things to suggest people to grow? <laughs> ah, that's a great, <laughs> a great question. Three things. Boy, I have to really uh, uh, scrunch it down. Well, for sure, the animal would be. A chicken, a, 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 lang, a laying chicken. Um, uh, they they eat your kitchen scraps. They you know they're they're they're, they're easy to keep. It doesn't take an expensive coop. Um, they take a you know, very very small space. They're child friendly. I mean, there's just they're, they're so and, and eggs are are. I mean, if if things if bad went to worse, you know, you could just you could about live on eggs for a long long time. Um, so they're they're a very they're a very complete you know complete food. So so. Number one animal for sure would be a chicken. Uh, as far as things to grow, um, uh, one of the easiest and most ubiquitous in our culture is tomatoes. And so I would certainly want to grow tomatoes. And you know, that, would be the, that would be the annual. And then the perennial uh, would probably be uh, you know, something like strawberries or or you know, a blackberries or something like that that has a pretty short life. I mean, I mean, you know, you could say an apple tree, but that's going to be several years. And I think, I mm-hmm. think the question, the question is about what can I get in now? Quick start, and, and, yep, quick, quick win, and, and, mm-hmm. and get rolling. Interesting. Okay, if we gave you more than three, because I had to constrain you to get you focused on there, but no, nah, maybe I didn't have to. But if you had a couple more, uh, what else would you add? Oh well, certainly you know certainly something like uh, asparagus, you know, which is a perennial, uh-huh. um, and and uh, takes a lot less care than some other things. Certainly, you know, a couple of fruit trees, you know, a plum and apple. Uh, goodness, grapevines! Grapevines grow everywhere. They're they're very they're not very um, uh, disease you know prevalent. And uh, so, you know, a, a, a good grapevine would be great. And then in addition, you know, your vegetables, you got, you know, you got your squash, certainly, you know, potatoes, peppers. I mean, the, the basic things, cucumbers that, that Americans eat. Um, uh, you know, part of, this, part of this whole thing is, is grow what you eat. I mean, mm-hmm. you, you don't want to go in to this new situation and grow stuff that you've never heard of. Uh, that just that that just adds you know insult to injury so you know grow grow the things i mean what americans eat are like nine vegetables well you know um lettuce and uh tomatoes and peppers and onions potatoes including sweet potatoes um you know those are those are those are ubiquitous in the system. I mean, from seed savers to seed comps catalogs, they're the they're the last thing to run out, uh, and in many ways, you know, kind of the easiest thing to grow. You know, you mentioned um, 
uh, squ- squash or that sort of thing. I, rem- I recall from our experiments with various garden uh, offerings that some things are much more fragile than others or they have special uh, constraints like corn. you got to have quite a few rows of that for it to pollinate correctly or whatever. Peas are very fragile to the heat or they're very susceptible to getting pilfered by rabbits or deer or whatever. Whereas some things that like uh, we've had... Uh, Zucchini or other other types of pumpkin squash, that sort of thing, or or uh, spearmint, they just take over. If you let raspberries, they'll just take over. So some things are extremely hardy and not so so, so susceptible to disease or pests or that sort of thing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And and different areas, you'll find uh, you know different areas will will enjoy different things, and so that just that's just where your experience comes in. But I'm I'm a big believer in you know, in some perennials, uh, as, as opposed to just annuals, mm-hmm. get, get some get some stuff in there that doesn't have to be planted every year. Uh, that's just going to continue to produce year after year after year. I mean, our our most um, prolific and easiest uh, perennial fruit is mulberries. Domestic domestic mulberries. Mm-hmm. I mean, those trees they they produce by gang, but and they have like a they have like a ninety day a harvest Long window, season. I mean, like apples and th- apples and things like that. You know, uh, plums, and you've got like you know two weeks, and and you're you know done. But a mulberry will just keep on pushing those things out for like ninety days. It's a real long, you know, long harvest period. And uh, the, to my, I mean, there's almost no disease. The only thing that affects mulberries is the birds come. <laughs> so you know, if you have if if you have some netting, and you can net them as they start to ripen. Um, then you can help to hold the birds out a little better. Okay. Um, you mentioned laying chickens as your number one thing that you mentioned under animals. Uh, we have a question from Tom Jode who says, why is there such a difference in taste of pastured eggs? Oh, well, that <laughs> difference in taste is, and you notice the yolk will be more orange. Um, it's two things. It, well, three things probably. It's exercise. And fresh air, and um, and the green the green material, all of the 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 scavenged uh, things, whether it's uh, food scraps, worms, bugs, uh, insects, grass, all of that scavenged stuff um, uh, enriches the bird's appetite, that then in turn produces an egg that's. Um, yeah, that's that's completely out of this world. I mean, the the difference in the habitat and diet of a pastured chicken versus a battery cage factory farm chicken never sees the light of day. Constantly living in a fecal particulate uh, uh, environment, uh, gets no green material, no fresh air, uh, only eats what's in its tray. And gets no exercise. I mean, the the, the difference is so profound, um, and that's why it shows up in the egg. Mm. Related question here from Sunny Preps, who says, I'm interested in raising chickens, pigs, and maybe sheep. Can they be rotated on the same pastures? In what order? Is it possible to ever get to the point that you wouldn't have to buy feed for this menagerie? (laughs) So chickens, pigs, and sheep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love the menagerie question. So here's the, here's the deal with pigs. Um, you know, pigs dig, and they're very they're very aggressive at digging. Now you can wring their nose, and and uh, and keep them from digging. And uh, you know, I'm not going to say that that is uh, sinful. We don't wring our pigs' noses just because you know we want them to be able to to fully express their their pigness, and that's <laughs> one of the. One of the most uh, distinctive features of a pig, you know, is being able to dig. Yeah. So, um, so the problem with pigs and chickens in the same place is the pigs are going to make divots, divots in your field that then the chickens, whether you're running in netting or running them in, in, in completely enclosed um, chicken shelters, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to have a real trouble trying to keep those divots from being escape places. Yes. For, for the chickens to get out, but but uh, sheep, sheep and pigs absolutely could uh, run. Uh, then again, if the if the sheep are are roguish, you might have some little trouble keeping them in. But generally, sheep don't go under stuff. 
generally sheep go over stuff. They want to jump or go over stuff. So even with some divots in the field, the sheep will probably still stay in. So uh, you, the, the compatibility of these things is, uh, is sometimes problematic. So we, we have, at our farm, we have dedicated pig pastures. So we have, we have pastures dedicated for pigs. Now, we've run cows through them. We've run chickens. Uh, we've run um, um, sheep through them. And uh, so, so, you know, even a torn-up field can handle, you know, cows and sheep and goats mm-hmm. and things like that as a compatible uh, type of animal in, on the same area. As far as, uh, as feeding them, um, remember that the omnivores, the omnivores need a, a, a beyond forage diet. Goats, sheep, cows, those are herbivores. They're fine. You shouldn't ever have to buy any feed for them. They should be, I mean, unless you have to buy some hay or something. But, but as far as living off of your own forage, your own just perennial plants, the herbivores will be fine. The omnivores in nature eat a tremendous number of seeds. Well, that's what grain is, is seeds. Or they, or they get, you know, drop fruit or nuts or bugs or whatever. And so, um, so in theory, in theory, if you um, could let your, if you had a handful of chickens, you know, ten, and they could range over, you know, seven or eight acres, they might be able to live off the land. We've appro- we approach that early on with an egg mobile with only 100 chickens in it where they could run over, you know, a fresh, like, mm-hmm. 10 acres a day. Mm-hmm. And those birds almost did live off the land. The problem is that when they get that sparse, they get 100% susceptible to aerial predation mm-hmm. and, um, and ground predation, mm-hmm. primarily aerial predation. And so the, the more scattered and spread out, a, a flock of chickens is the more susceptible it is to predation. Hmm. So while yes, in theory, that that spread out flock, there's enough cream there for them to live on. In practice, that kind of arrangement will end up with no chicken, <laughs> no chickens yeah. pretty soon. They get picked off uh, by it, hawks. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's just a practical thing. So so typically, a small homestead flock of chickens. Um, you know, you would enclose. You might, you know, if you're going to be out in the shop or out working in the garden, then you, you, know, you can let them out while you're there close. But otherwise, you'd have them in some sort of a portable shelter that you'd move around. And when it's conducive, you open up a door and let them out. And, um, and, and you kind of you kind of hybridize. So you give them some supplements. You get them all your kitchen scraps. You give them garden weeds. Uh, if you've got, you know, a, a zucchini that got away, you bust that up and throw it in there. Uh, I mean, chickens are the ultimate, ultimate recycler. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got much production going on at all, you're going to have everything from weeds to spoilage to, you know, to rotten stuff to overage stuff. And all of that is, um, you know, is great for the chickens. When they're out on on this portable uh, uh, tractor or whatever you call it that you move around, um, do you, when they're out, on the pasture, do you have like a, a portable net or something over them to, to reduce the risk of them getting picked off by hawks? Well, I mean, you could. I'm just saying if you're out there, um, if you're out there, you know, the hawk tends to not come when you're okay. anywhere close. Um, but, yeah, I mean, if, if you're going to actually turn them out into a place and go to town to your office, uh, you're you're going to come home with some feathers. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, so so I mean this this is the this is the grim grim reality of chickens. Everybody loves to see chickens out on the pasture, out on the range, <laughs> and you know, th- this is one of the tensions in our farm business. You know, half of our customers um, vote for liberals who do all these endangered species things and make it illegal to you know control hawks. But they also want free-range eggs, you know. So here we've got a hawk on sitting on every fence post, and we're trying to run these chickens out, you know, on pasture. And and I'm not interested in killing all the hawks. Don't don't no, right, right, right. I'm yeah, not, but, yeah. but 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 
Uh, but to say that you go to jail if you if you shoot one uh, when there's one on every fence post waiting to uh, pick your pocket, uh, there's a, there's a lot of a lot of leeway here between picking up the you know the few that come in and are problems each year, you know versus extermination. And uh, I mean I like to see a hawk as as much as anybody. I just don't like to see him taking off one of my chickens. We mentioned it in the past, but I've got to mention it again right here is the, the movie, The Biggest Little Farm. If people haven't seen that, you've got to see it. We'll put a link in the in the description of this video. It addresses this exact dynamic that you're talking about in a very thought-provoking way, and that's a really good point to, to bring into the conversation. So, folks, you've got to see The Biggest Little Farm. If there's, That's a great, great family-friendly movie. Slightly, slightly traumatic just because of there's a dust storm that attacks there and some wildfires and some coyotes and stuff, but if you can get past that, um, very eye-opening, very informative. Joel, any uh, last thoughts before we let you go? We've got a boatload of more questions we didn't have a chance to talk about, and any of the topics that we scratched, we could plunge, you know, plumb for hours, but um, this was a great visit together. Is there anything else you want to leave our viewers with before we let you go? Uh, no, except that I am, I am right now a little... Uh, I'm about two thirds through a, a, another book. Uh, it's the title is um, uh, Homestead Animal Happiness, and uh, and it's all all the stuff that we just talked about is in this book. Uh, it's essentially everything that we've done scaled down to the homestead level. And since since I started very very small many many years ago, I can I can easily traverse that world between, you know, homestead scale and commercial scale, the average person can't. And so this book is all about trying to scale the principles down so they can be understood and done and duplicated on a, you know, on a much smaller, even a backyard scale. So I'm excited about it and hope to have it available, you know, sometime, sometime here in 2021 uh, before, the, before the Christmas rush gets Before away. the snow flies. Um, yeah. Okay, so... Uh... This has been great. Um, Ma, you really got our minds, uh, gears going now about the people. Check out Yonder Farms. Check out Harvest Hosts. And check out the book Selling the Invisible and uh, Plandemic, the film, as well as go to polyfacefarms.com to find out all the event calendar that's coming up that uh, springing out of uh, Joel's and his uh, family's creative imagination. And uh, also just remember, folks, as Joel mentioned about uh, dropping mainstream um, social media because of the negative influence that it's having on some people's life or lack of privacy, et cetera, et cetera. We are, you can also find us on brighton.com and on rumble.com. I'll put pictures of those up here. We'll put links to our uh, channels there so that you can make sure you don't miss anything if you choose to use those more uh, free speech related platforms. So Joel Salatin, co-founder of Polyface Farms, thank you, as always, for joining us here on Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. Thank you, Donegan. It's always an honor. If you've decided that now is the right time for you to protect your family's financial future by acquiring physical precious metals, gold and silver, I'm delighted to let you know that I have now become a licensed dealer's representative for Miles Franklin, one of the oldest and most trusted names in bullion dealerships and we can provide you with physical delivery to your personal possession or to professional fault storage or precious metals IRAs. Just email me at libertyandfinance at protonmail.com and please include your name and phone number in your email to libertyandfinance at protonmail.com. We'll get right back with you and find out how to best meet your needs so that you can either begin or increase your acquisition of physical precious metals now and protect your family's future starting today. To acquire gold and silver, just go to libertyandfinance.com. When the main site comes up, click on Bullion Sales. That's libertyandfinance.com, Bullion Sales. You'll see my name, Donegan Kaiser, my phone number, and my associate, Kaiser Johnson, his phone number, our email, libertyandfinance at protonmail.com.